thank you very much for having me. My, my name is Lisa Barsali. I'm a scientist at uh, um, MIT and part of the LIGO laboratory. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you what's the status of the LIGO and Virgo instruments towards the next observing RANO3, and I'm going to give this talk on behalf of both the LIGO and Virgo collaborations. Okay, here is where uh, we, we ended uh, with the second observing run 2 as of August 2017. Um, pretty sure you heard that the run was successful. Uh, so here is a summary of the performance of the three instruments, Virgo, Hanford, and Livingston, uh, at the end of 2 uh, You see Virgo in uh, purple, Hanford in, in red, and Livingston in uh, cyan. Um, so the, just, just briefly to remind you, um, uh, the difference in sensitivity between Virgo and, and, and LIGO is mainly due to the fact that Virgo uh, did a spectacular job in trying to uh, go in observing mode only after a few months since the first uh, lock of the instruments, so since the first time they brought the instruments on the operating point. Um, and that was to try to, uh, to join uh, the two LIGO detectors during the observing run. Uh, so this, this gap will, will reduce as time, as time goes. Um, the other noticeable things uh, is the difference between the Hanford and Livingston detector, and this is the question that we usually get, why the two instruments uh, were performing differently. You see the, um, the red trace is significantly higher than the blue one at below 100 hertz, and you can also see some bumps in the high frequency region around one kilohertz. Uh, so in the first part of my talk, I would try to uh, tell you what we learned uh, um, after the end of O2 that explain these discrepancies, and I will tell you what we have been doing since August to try to make all of the three detectors better for the next observing run. Uh, and in general, at all of the three sites, uh, there has been a sequence of commissioning and installation of new hardware, and then commissioning, and, 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 and that will continue uh, towards O3. Okay, I'm going to start with uh, Hanford uh, detector. Um, and so the first question that I'm trying to answer is why there was the excess of noise at high frequency, those bumps that were in the, that you saw in the curve with respect to Livingston. Um, so uh, the, this is what we think uh, happened and we learned that right after the end of O2. So the Amford was exploring, uh, during the time leading to O2, Amford was exploring operation at twice uh, higher power than during the first observing run. Um, and, and it was doing that with a new high power laser. Uh, and in parallel, Livingston was operating at the same power, power as during uh, the observing run 01 and, and focusing on improving the low frequency. Uh, so there were two problems that were observed and this problem had been clarified at the end of the second observing run 02. So what we think it happened is that this high power laser was introducing higher, uh, we call it laser jitter noise, is a pointing of the laser entering as it enters the interferometer. And that was due to the water flow in the cooling system. And then the second aspect is that the coupling itself of this noise to the interferometer uh, was larger. And, and we learned that, uh, well, we think that that was due to a point absorber on one of the input test masses. And just to, uh, since in these conferences we usually uh, show pictures of exploding neutron stars, I thought I would actually put a picture of uh, what these point absorbers look like. <laughs> this is, uh, it's actually very small, like the diameter of, of this image is only 150 micron. Um, so we think that the combination of these two factors is what caused the excess of noise at high frequency that you saw during. Uh, so, um, so um, the understanding of this noise also made it such that uh, we could actually subtract it post post facto. And so in post processing, we, the the Hanford data has been has been cleaned. Uh, and the way in which uh, we do that is by using witness auxiliary auxiliary channels that are sensitive to this laser jitter noise. And so uh, this, uh, this plot shows the difference between, um, so in, in blue you see the, uh, um, 
low latency uh, sensitivity of the of the instruments, and in red is the what you get after subtracting uh, this noise. And Livingston didn't have this noise, so the two curves look pretty much the same. But in Amford, there is a big difference, uh, and uh, this cleaning of the data improved the. Uh, in post-processing, the range was improved about 27% for the for the Hanford detector, and there is a public note uh, written by Jenny Driggers and, and others who explains how this analysis was done. Okay, so this is not the full story because this noise we think explain only the excess of noise in the high frequency region. Uh, a low frequency, you saw there was a, a, quite a significant discrepancy between Livingston and Hanford. And uh, here is another piece of the puzzle. Uh, so this noise actually got worse uh, during the second observing run. Um, and in particular, it got significantly worse after uh, an earthquake in Montana. We call it the infamous earthquake, uh, July 6th. And this uh, kind of... Uh, this plot that I, I made combining uh, two different plots shows the uh, binary neutron stars for Hanford before the earthquake, which is above 60 megaparsec. And then there, are, there is a two weeks recovery uh, because a very, it wasn't a very strong earthquake, but it was very close to the site. And after that, you see a significant uh, reduction in the range. And in the top panel on the, on the right, uh, I show a plot that shows the, what happened in the sensitivity. So there you need to compare the blue trace before the earthquake and the red trace after the earthquake. Uh, and the yellow is the difference of the two. So it's the extra noise in, that we found after this earthquake. Uh, so uh, we have understood, partially understood and recovered this noise, but not entirely. And so uh, to wrap this up, uh, for Hanford looking toward O3, this is what we expect. So the um, high-powered laser that was uh, too noisy was replaced. And that's true also at Livingston. So when Livingston will start operating in high power, uh, uh, we, won't, we won't have the noisy uh, laser. And at Hanford, the input test mass with the point absorber was also replaced. So the expectation is that this extra noise at high frequency won't be present during O3. For the low frequency noise, uh, as, as I said, was, uh, the reason for that noise was at least partially understood as extra charge that we think was deposited on the mirror uh, as, the er as the earthquake hit the, the site, the, the mirror was pushed toward the earthquake stops. And we think that that it could be a, a, a way in which the, the mirror got charged. Uh, the optics was decharged, but the noise only partially improved. Uh, and then in parallel, we have developed a new sensors uh, to measure the electric fields near the test masses. And that will help us identify other different mechanisms of noise produced by charge. Uh, so uh, pretty much uh, that's the status for Hanford. Uh, the finding the origin of these remaining axes of noise would be the main focus of the commissioning activity leading to O3, um, and that's uh, where, where we, stand, we stand now. Uh, okay, let me move to uh, the Livingston uh, detector. Uh, let me first put it in context of where we are. So the Livingston interferometer was operating at the best sensitivity ever measured so far, um, about 100 megaparsec uh, by a neutron start. This is not yet uh, the design sensitivity uh, of advanced LIGO. Uh, in particular, we were operating with about 100 kilowatts of laser light in the arms, and we think that with the, uh, the uh, you know, at, at full power, the we should be closer to 700 kilowatts, 750 kilowatts, so we are significantly lower power. And that's, uh, and that's the discrepancy that you see at high frequency between where we are and where uh, we, we could be in, in advanced LIGO. The other traces that you see there are the uh, uh, coating thermal noise. Uh, that is one of the fundamental noises that limits the sensitivity around under dirt and the quantum, quantum noise of the detectors. Okay, so this was Livingston uh, during O2, uh, so better than ever, not yet a design sensitivity. Uh, if we go more into the, into the detail of where the noise of the uh, 
uh, instrument came from. Uh, this is the next slide. Uh, so here you see in black is the total measured noise, and the yellow curve is all the noise that we uh, understood and we characterize and we expect. And so there you see a gap uh, under, below under the earth between the noise that we understand and the noise that we actually measure. Um, and all the other traces are the uh, either technical noises or the fundamental noises uh, that contribute to the, to the yellow trace. And uh, you can see the cyan curve is actually the limits of the apparatus. So at the current op operating power for, for O2, uh, without any of the technical noise, we think the instrument should be closer to the cyan. Uh, so there is, uh, let's say there is a gap between the noises that we understand and the one that we measure, and this is also very much expected. Uh, that's how uh, that's how it works. Um, and then, uh, but we have a, a, a pretty well understanding of, of all the noises that makes the the yellow the yellow curve. Uh, so this is the what I call the simplified plot. Uh, just for this audience, I'm going to show the unsimplified plot. That can be a bit overwhelming, uh, but there it goes. So here it is. <laughs> And so it's the same concept, but this plot pretty much summarizes all the knowledge of the instruments that we have. So for each noise source that we know, we are projecting the impact on the, on the total noise. And so the main message from this plot is that at high frequency, above 100 Hz, there is pretty much one noise source, which is quantum noise, and at high frequency manifest as shot noise. So that's the uncertainties in the time arrival of the photons at the detector. Uh, and so that's uh, it's a, uh, not, not simple, but it's, uh, it's uh, well understood. At a, a low frequency, we have pretty much everything else from, um, from um, control noises to uh, scattered light noise, meaning spurious lights that hit some uh, uh, surfaces in the detector and finds a path back to the main uh, photodetector. And that's why it's hard uh, to, uh, to attack the low frequency. Mainly, there are many noise sources that we do understand, and there are some that we, we don't. Um, so uh, now I'm going to, so informed by this plot that is pretty much uh, the, uh, I don't know what's the equivalent for the data analysis, maybe the, um, um, the you know, parameters of your, of your neutron stars, that's all the knowledge we have uh, for the instrument. So informed uh, by this plot, we have um, started a campaign attacking all the noise sources uh, that we could, uh, could think of for 403. So let me start with the, let's say, easy one, the high frequency, so quantum noise. Uh, the noise reduction at high frequency is, the strategy is simple. There are two things you can do. You can either increase the power in your circulating power in your instruments, and the noise at high frequency scale as the square root of the power. Uh, or you can inject squeeze light. Uh, squeeze light uses quantum optics uh, to manipulate the vacuum fluctuations that enter your interferometer and create shot noise. I could spend an hour just talking about squeeze light works, so I will just move on in the interest of time. Um, so both approaches are particularly difficult when you try to do a lot of both, like if you try to increase the power by a lot, a lot meaning several, you know, a factor of five, it's very difficult, or if you try to produce a lot of squeezing. Uh, so for O3, the strategy that we developed is let's just do both, and just do, have both available and do a bit of each. Uh, and so the, the goal for, o, for O3 is to increase the power by a factor of two, hitting a 200 kilowatts uh, laser, uh, laser power circulating in the arms. And 3 dB of squeezing, uh, we like to use dBs to measure squeezing. That's how it is. That's equivalent to a 40% shot noise reduction. So the combination of 3 dB of squeezing and doubling the power would be equivalent to increase the power by a factor of four. Um, so that's the overall strategy at both sites. Uh, and now I have some good news to share from an early commissioning window that happened at Livingston um, Early, early this year. 
uh, in between the in upgrades. So the squeezer was installed and the new laser was installed. And this is the, uh, uh, some preliminary results. So the interferometer was stably operated up to 170 kilowatts. This is not quite as high as we aimed for O3, but uh, it was already uh, a significant success. Uh, the reason why it's hard is because as you increase the power, the, the control of the instruments becomes more complicated, and there are several reasons why that's true, and each of these reasons has been several PhD theses spanning many years. Uh, so here I'm just going to name it. It's uh, alignment instabilities and parametric instabilities. Uh, so we are learning how to deal uh, with these problems. So just to say that increasing the power is not, is not a knob that you, you turn. It's, it's way more complicated than that, and that's why it takes time. Um, also, uh, we had a chance to test a newly installed squeeze light source. Um, and uh, I'm particularly proud of this because I've spent several years of, of my own life to prepare for this. So at the first attempt, uh, we measured a 15% shot noise uh, reduction. The way in which you do that, this is a new hardware that you install, and then you couple your squeeze light to the interferometer. Uh, so it's very encouraging. It's not yet the 40% that we aim for 403. So the message is that uh, we we have done good progress on both increasing the power and doing squeezing. There is more work needed to reach the, the, the target that we have for 403. So that was the low frequency. Let me go back to the, um, sorry, that was the high frequency. Now let me go back to the unsimplified plot. And now I will explain what we, have been do what we are doing for the uh, low frequency uh, noise. Um, again, there are many noise sources and each of them uh, once again, has uh, it's many PhDs and engineering development and a, a lot of physics actually behind each of them. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, give you a very brief example of the things that we are doing. So one of the most uh, difficult uh, problems in uh, suspended interferometers is how to deal with scattered light. As I explained before, you have spurious light that from your interferometer reaches moving parts in the detector and finds a path back to the main uh, detector that measure gravitational waves. Uh, this is a problem everywhere in all the in instrument, in all the gravitational waves detector, everywhere it's always been, and hopefully it won't be uh, in the future, but that's, that's life uh, uh, in 2018. Uh, so this is an example of scattered light mitigation. Uh, we put, pretty much you put uh, black glass everywhere, and we thought we had already done that, but every time we learned that there are more places where you should put black glasses. So this is an example. This is a, uh, so on the left you see a SOLIDWORKS model of one of the, uh, of the chambers uh, in, uh, of, of LIGO, and you see those, um, those baffles uh, at, the, at, the, at the front, and the right is the actual, the actual black uh, baffles there. So the idea is that if there is spurious light in these baffles, uh, the light is, doesn't go, it's not reflected, and so we, we mitigate the, this problem. So we have a campaign of uh, baffles installation at both sites. Uh, it's a lot of engineering uh, development uh, that is actually uh, nearly complete now. And the images in the bottom, the before and after, shows what you would see by looking at, at exactly the, the chamber that is on the front uh, before. So you see all these uh, lights, uh, lights there. And after installing all the baffle, the camera is dark, and that's what you want. So this worked well. We haven't yet uh, uh, measured the clear impact in the sensitivity. And so that will also be uh, one of the things that we will be focusing later, uh, later in the summer. So just to uh, wrap up the status of LIGOS today, um, so we had commissioning windows with the full interferometers right after O2 at Hanford, where we were doing the investigation for why the noise was higher during O2. Uh, and early 2018 at Livingston, where we uh, tried to increase the power and, and tested squeezing for the first time. And both of these uh, commissioning windows have been very informative, and they're guiding uh, how we prepare for the next commissioning phase. Um, so the last major upgrade uh, that is happening right now at both sites is the replacement of the end test masses. Uh, 
um, can talk, can ask me why we, we're doing that. Um, uh, so the, um, while doing this mass replacement, uh, we had a failure in the, um, in the glass fibers that are uh, holding the mirrors. And that actually happened uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And that contributed to a revised schedule toward O3 that I will present at the end of my talk. Um, so both LIGO instruments, after the replacement of the NTS masses, both LIGO instruments will be in full interferometer configuration and commissioning mode again, starting in June, July. And the current estimate is we will need at least six months of commissioning to take full advantage of the new hardware that we have installed. So it will be uh, operational high power, squeezing, uh, mitigation of scattered light, uh, control of the interferometer high power. So there is a quite broad range of activities that we'll be doing over the summer. So summer will be busy for us. Um, so since I'm running late, let me, uh, let me just show you the, uh, some, let's call it conservative projections for O3. So just doing uh, what I told you, uh, increasing the power and squeezing, we can reach a benchmark of 120 megaparsec. So you see the blue curve is where we are now uh, in O2 with Livingston. And then if you increase the power, you improve the shot noise at high frequency and you, and you get a red trace. And then the cyan trace is if you add squeezing on top of that. And that brings bring us at high frequency very close to the advanced LIGO design sensitivity. At low frequency, uh, the gap between, um, the, the, it's harder to quantify what the improvement could be uh, for the reason that I just explained. So we hope it will be better than 120. The message is we can do 120 only by improving the high frequency sensitivity. Not that we will, uh, not that that's the only thing that we would do. Okay, let me move to the Virgo uh, detector in, in Italy, and I will go quicker because pretty much uh, the strategies are the same, and Virgo as well. Virgo is the three kilometer detector uh, near Pisa. It's also seven minutes far from my house where I grew up, so I'm very, I'm very happy uh, that uh, Virgo uh, is contributing so much to the, to the field. Um, and uh, so you all know that Virgo joined O2 and it was a spectacular addition to the network because the good localization of GW170817 was uh, pretty much due to, to, to Virgo. Uh, so since O2, uh, Virgo had a, a broad campaign attacking all the noises as, as LIGO. Uh, so for, that, for the high frequency improvement, it's pretty much the same strategy, new laser for high power plus squeezing. Um, the, the main difference is that uh, Virgo had a particular noise source in O2, which was due to the presence of steel wires that were suspending the, the optics. And that was instead of glass fibers. And that was due to a temporary, um, was due to a failure in the few silica fibers. Uh, um, and so to, to be able to join O2, they temporarily replaced the glass fibers with steel fibers, and that increased the thermal noise of the instrument. So the low frequency sensitivity of Virgo was mostly limited by that. Uh, in the meantime, Virgo had done an aggressive plan to understand the problem and solving it. So now glass fibers have been installed right after O2 in all of the test masses. And so the, we expect a significant improvement just from, from that. And then on top of that, Virgo will do the same campaign of attacking all the no known noise sources and finding the unknown ones. Uh, the upgrade phase has been completed very recently and commissioning uh, restarted. Uh, the full interferometer was relocked in the uh, final operating mode uh, last week. And so the assessment of the noise with the, new, with the uh, glass fibers is imminent. Uh, there is not the calibrated spectrum yet. Uh, and then what we expect is the installation of the, of the fibers will expose other noises below 100 hertz. And so here is a, 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 a summary of what uh, the noise projections are. So in, in red is where we are now, and the, the yellow curve is, if you don't do anything else, just replacing the fibers, that's what you expect. And the range should go from 30 megaparsecs to approximately 50 megaparsec. On top of that, the, uh, the, let's say the upper bound is the uh, fundamental trace that you have if you operate the instruments at the power target for the three, which is 50 watts input is similar to LIGO. It's about 200 kilowatts in the arms. Uh, 
and that will be 100 megaparsec. That curves is without any technical noise. So we don't think that's, that's realistic. The target for Virgo is between 65 and 85 megaparsec for O3. OK. Oh, wow. OK. Uh, it's, it's ringing. So uh, I'm, 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 I'm almost there. So let me step back for a second. I talk about LIGO and Virgo. You know, this is, uh, those are three of the detectors that are, um, um, that comprise the, that, that, that forms the worldwide network. Uh, you know about GEO is the 600 meter interferometer that is always operational uh, or operational most of the time in, in Germany. Uh, there is a, a three kilometers underground detector Kagra, which is under, um, uh, commissioning, uh, installation and commissioning phase in, in Japan. They had in encouraging results recently, so they are operating a, a three kilometer Michelson interferometer with one of the mirror operated cryogenically. So there is good results and Kagra um, has expressed the uh, uh, interest in trying to join O3 probably at the very end. So they're working toward this goal. Um, we, you also know that um, there is a, a, another interferometer planned in India with a tentatively scheduled for operation uh, at the moment is around 2024. So you're probably familiar with the uh, LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra observing scenario that the three collaborations uh, published together. Um, so here summarizes the, uh, the target for LIGO and Virgo. For LIGO, I told you 120 is the, what we think we can do with just high power increase. Uh, if we increase the low frequency, uh, we could have a higher, higher gain. Same things with Virgo, 65, 85 megaparsec. And uh, Kagra, in, the, in this schedule, uh, the first operation for Kagra was supposed to be in the 2020. As I said, they're, they're trying to, uh, to hit a harder deadline to join, join O3. Um, very quickly, I just want to, uh, I think this community knows very well, I focus on the instruments, but one of the biggest change in O3 is not, uh, not just that the instruments will be um, more sensitive, it's that uh, LIGO and Virgo will share the alerts uh, publicly and uh, with the, in, in low latency. Uh, so low latency order of minutes. Um, retractions or confirmation will follow in a, in a matter of hours. The system for uh, autonomous alert is under development right now. And so this is also a major change together with instrument improvement uh, for, for O2. And then I'm on my last slide. Uh, and I want to share with you the most updated uh, working schedule towards O3. Uh, this is a summary of everything I've said. Uh, so you see there is uh, upgrades and commissioning phases. Uh, and uh, given uh, some of the problems I mentioned, for example, the breakage of the uh, glass fibers at, at, in LIGO, um, we have said earlier that you know, this target sensitivity of 120 and 60 for LIGO and 65 for Virgo uh, we should be able to get it by the end of this year. And now we think that the most realistic scenario is that early next year. Um, and here you see also a tentative schedule for engineering runs uh, in which we will try to operate the three instruments at the same time. So one is scheduled mid-October. These dates might change. So this is our best understanding now. Uh, and then we'll transition in a, a, about a month-long engineering run early next year and then move into the observing run. And that's when we will be able to uh, produce uh, open public alerts. Okay, so. Let me conclude just by saying that things are, are actually progressing well. There is a, a lot of things that are happening at all of the observatories, but uh, um, so far things look very promising for O3. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, Lisa. Thanks very much for this wonderful summary. Can you say a bit more about the fiber breakage? what caused it and if it's a problem? Yeah, so um, the, so let's say we have, um, I might get the numbers wrong, but I think we, so far we have installed uh, fibers on, uh, I think 11 test masses, I think that's the number. Uh, at the very early days we had two failures that were very well understood. Um, 
Then we have, I think this is maybe the second failure that is not totally uh, understood why, but the, it happened as the, so the, the suspension is put together outside the chamber and then you have to move it in. And so in the process of moving, uh, the suspension in the fibers broke. Um, so uh, I think that's as much as we know now. I don't, I don't expect to be, uh, to be a, a big problem. Like next time, uh, maybe the, the procedures would be slightly revised. It's the same procedures that works well, let's say 70 or 80% of the time, so. Uh, in the so Lisa, um, so you showed that there is going to be significant improvement, especially at the low frequency range, which will affect the, the black hole binary mergers more. And I know for historical reasons, the, the distance, detection distances are usually quoted for neutron star binary mergers, but given that potential improvement, can you tell us for something like GW150914, 30 solar mass black holes, what would be the improvement in detection distance? Yeah, there? so um, I think it's still true that at this, uh, in these cases, the, the two scales pretty much the same. Here I am quoting the 3030 solar mass improvement uh, in, the conservative, in the conservative region. So you, um, for the 50 watts plus 3, 3 dB, this is without a significant improvement at low frequency. Uh, at high frequency, I can get you the number, should be published in the observing scenario document. But I don't think, it, I think it's, it still scales pretty much uh, the same. So are there any residual differences between the sites themselves, the actual ground? And if so, does that impact future site selection? Um, so there is a difference between the two sites, yes, is because one, one than, is in... One's better than the other? Uh, at, at some frequencies. They're all better than the other. It depends in which frequency, frequency band. But yes, I think the, uh, the... Well, Matt will talk probably about that in terms of site selection for the next sites. He always wants the quietest possible. <laughs> Quite as possible sites. Okay, so let's thank Lisa again and invite the next speaker.